So the latest in our books of the year, which we're going through one by Here one, is, is uh, Nothing But A Good Time, The Spectacular Rise and Fall of Glam Metal by Justin Quirk. Justin, it was, it was a terrific guest on, uh, on one, of our, great. one of our crowdcasts this year. He, when he, he was faintly apologetic about this when, he, when we first, uh, first uh, communicated via email. He said, I don't think you like this kind of thing. You know? I don't think you or Mark will like this kind of music. Which, and it's probably fair to say that it's not our, you know, not well, no, it's, immediately reached for. But it's not something we'd ever, I'd never really, I didn't know much about it, really. It's that whole age of big hair and frock coats and cardboard boots and that sort of fabulously cartoonish stage act that everybody had. It started, didn't it, in MTV uh, in about 1983 and uh, eventually developed what he calls a slow puncture with Guns N' Roses and was killed off by Nirvana. And so it's it's just a whole area of music I don't really know anything about at all. No, I, I mean, didn't. I didn't. And and I certainly didn't kind of draw the, the you know, the parallels and the lessons that he he draws. And that's, that's what makes this book really interesting. I don't know if it's rather patronising to say this. It's a very clever book about yeah. some very dumb music. Yeah. Uh, but but pointing out the cleverness behind the apparent dumbness, I think that's fair to say. Yeah, he, very, he, very he, true. He does he does it in lots of ways that other people wouldn't have wouldn't have got round to. And for instance, I'm fascinated by the parallels he draws with the um, with the rise of WWF. I know. Yeah, <laughs> Hulk Hogan went on stage Hulk. to uh, Eye of the Tiger, didn't he? Isn't that right? <laughs> I've got to read. Can I Go just on. read a little bit? Yeah. Uh, it, 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 it might seem like a digression, but it's not. Hogan, Hulk Hogan was a strange looking, somewhat unreal character, even by the standards of modern wrestling. He was impossible to place an age on. Professional contact sport is typically the preserve of the young, but with his straw like mullet and balding head, Hogan appeared two decades older from the neck up than he did from the neck down. He was clearly physically strong, but with a smooth, swollen torso, which had an undefined rubberized sheen. I like that. His bandit mustache could have been the color it was from bleaching, the graying ravages of old age, or a heavy cigarette habit. In his torn banana yellow muscle vest, he looked like a cheap action figure of himself. That's a really good point. He lectured young Hulk maniac fans on the need to take their vitamins, pray, and believe in themselves. Yet 10 years later, he took the standard to criminal trial and admit to his own long history of anabolic steroid use. Hogan was a mess of physical and social contradictions, but nobody in his fan base cared. He was clearly a construct, removed from the usual restrictions and rules of celebrity more rock star or fictional character than sportsman. And what he's saying is that these people had a huge, you know, impact on the way that the, that the fans of glam metal looked at the world. You know, they didn't expect their heroes to be particularly consistent. You know, they accepted that they were just mad, larger than life constructs. And they were, they were perfectly happy with that. And I think it's, it's that kind of really interesting parallel. And they're, the really interesting way of, of placing glam metal in the kind of context of all entertainment and culture that makes this such such an interesting book, don't you think? Oh, I think it's amazing. Uh, he goes back to tracing the 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 origins of, of glam metal. It goes back to David Bowie, obviously, and Mark Bolan and, and Alice Cooper, but also back to A Clockwork Orange and the sensational Alex Harvey band doing yeah. Next, yeah. you know, yeah. the old Jack Brell number. I love all that. And he talks about the way the groups were marketed. He talks about the, the branding and pyramid selling scheme of Kiss. It's really interesting. Yeah. Very funny about Ozzy Osbourne, the world's least convincing werewolf. Um, there's lots about the daft metal pantomime of Wasp and their circular saws and Cinderella with their military jackets and their bondage accessories. Terrible acts like Tiger Tails and, and kind of Rothschild, you know. Uh, but he makes a really good point of it, which is that glam metal was ludicrous, but it did it sincerely. Yeah. So once Nirvana came along, who were kind of ironic and self-referential, it, it made glam metal impossible again. He says it will never revive. Um, I was going to read a little. Shall I read a little extract? Yeah, go on. Too? on. There was a, one of the key things for me was his observations 
about what glam metal said about the country that produced it. And I've never read anything quite as, um, as profound, really, and as, as, as well observed and as in depth, actually, about glam metal as this extract here. He says, uh, Wasps, the headless children, saw the band move away from the blood spurting, high octane camp of their earlier albums and towards a slower, more doom laden sound and something more like social commentary. The cover depicted a procession of dictators, religious fanatics, clansmen, and murderers before a gaping, flame licked hell mouth. But crucially, they appear to be walking out of rather than down into the abyss. Guns and Roses world worldview was similarly darkening. On Paradise City, Axl Rose had depicted what he saw as, beneath the pomp and exaggeration, the reality of America's ragged existence, with Captain America reduced to a pitiful, clownish figure. And as the new year began, Rose would take to wearing a lurid pair of star and stripes, stars and stripes cycling shorts on stage, stripped to the waist, eyes closed, breath pumping through his nostrils like an exhausted thoroughbred and sweat greasing his pale skin. Really good, that. He was an unlikely standard bearer, but by his cold-eyed reading of the country, the self-loathing, paranoia and aggression that consumed Rose made him the perfect flag waver for it. Just as Jimi Hendrix had marked the end of the 60s in its utopian dreaming with a feedback strangled retelling of the Star Spangled Banner, Rose touted the stars and stripes not as some swaggering patriotic gesture, but a reclamation of the flag as a symbol of everything that raged within him. With his racism, misogyny, seething anger, and barely contained violence, Rose was the product of his, of his country. And whether that country liked it or not, he was holding up a mirror to them and forcing them to look closely at what stared back. That's really good, isn't it? It's a terrific Amazing. thing. It's just terrifically well put. Nothing but a good time. Uh, the spectacular rise and fall of glam metal by Justin Quirk, one of our books of the year. There you go.